how to make yourself uh, stand out as a leader, how to succeed uh, building a network in a new country using LinkedIn. So uh, hello everybody. My uh, name is Jan. I, um, uh, I think I have to, to tell you a story to tell you who, who on earth I am. Uh, first of all, I was a member of ISAC uh, back in the days when I studied in the US in uh, the 90s. And um, this was back in the pre-internet days. And uh, so uh, I was uh, lucky enough to go to a school in the US called Ohio State, which happened to be actually where some of the commercial internet was launched. It's where Prodigy and CompuServe uh, came from, which were two companies that actually were the first one to, to really commercialize uh, the web back in, uh, back in the 90s. So when I came back to Norway, I, um, I, I started working for the broadsheet newspaper Aftenposten. And um, uh, I was in charge of uh, about a hundred people selling the newspaper subscriptions for the morning and the, new, and the evening paper. Um, and this was back in the, in the heydays of, uh, of uh, print media. And, uh, and uh, you know, times would never be as good for media as it was back in 94, 95. Uh, one day my, my manager said, um, would anyone like to volunteer to make Often Posten's first online newspaper. And since I had been introduced to these companies in the US that I mentioned, uh, I was the only one to raise my hand. And even though I had no idea what an online newspaper was, because there were there was only one at the time, but I didn't even know about that. There was one in, uh, in Palo Alto, no, in, in San Jose in, in Silicon Valley. And so I raised my hand and I got the opportunity to, um, uh, to be one or two people on the project team to, to make oftenposten.no. Uh, which uh, turned out to be the second online newspaper in Norway. We were beaten by a week by a, a tabloid. Anyway, this was so much fun. So uh, I, I couldn't go back to being a newspaper uh, subscription sales manager after that. So I decided to, uh, uh, to continue um, in, a, in a more digital uh, path. And uh, I was lucky enough to get involved in um, the launch of Scandinavia Online, which was sort of like America Online at the time. And um, and also by doing so, uh, we sold <coughs> the first uh, online advertising in Scandinavia in 95-96. Uh, and um, one at that time, if you can imagine, uh, there were approximately a hundred thousand people in Norway who had access to the internet uh, online advertising was basically non-existent in in the world and uh, we would actually hard code banner ads on the top of the page and we had no idea how many people saw it you couldn't click on it because the advertisers wouldn't have websites and um, and it was probably the most expensive piece of advertising ever done so uh, the price was basically decided by me and um, Telenor was the first uh, advertiser with their yellow pages at the time. So um, one day, <clears throat> two people showed up in the lobby from uh, New York from a company called DoubleClick. And DoubleClick would allow us to show different ads on the same piece of real estate at the same time to different people. So all of us could see different ads depending on who we were, where we came from, and what kind of interest we had. And uh, at the same time, we could also see how many people clicked and how they interacted with it and, and get real-time reporting. And that's when I realized that uh, advertising, advertising is never going to be the same. This is going to change everything from, from now on. So I became uh, DoubleClick's first uh, client in Scandinavia, and uh, eventually also uh, DoubleClick asked me to join them to launch their office in uh, in Norway, which I did. And uh, so I ran that for about four years. And um, after 9/11 uh, and the terror attack in uh, in New York, uh, 
some people thought the internet was actually going to disappear because um, the advertising industry completely plummeted. It went down like 95% overnight, especially online. And uh, DoubleClick got a little worried, so they started selling parts of their uh, European business. And at that time, some of my colleagues in, in Germany and the UK especially, they joined this strange little company called Google. And uh, I knew about Google because I used it every time I hired people. I, I like to Google them to see uh, what kind of people they were. But, uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, when we searched, we usually used the other search engines like Yahoo and AltaVista and Lycos and Excite and Hotbot. And there were like 10 search engines at that time. But still, I told my friends in the UK and Germany who left uh, DoubleClick, I said, uh, when you're ready to launch Google in Norway, let me know. And, um, and I sort of stayed in touch with them. And so, um, so uh, I did, and uh, they did. And uh, in 2004, they called me and asked uh, if I was ready to uh, launch the operation in uh, Denmark. So uh, in the beginning of uh, 2005, I started, uh, started Google in Denmark. And then uh, a few months later, after having hired people there, I started Google in Norway and spent uh, the next 15 years uh, doing that. And, um, and Google then was uh, a very small business. We were about 2,000 people worldwide. And as you know, today Google is about, uh, it's about 100, uh, 150,000 people and with approximately, uh, I guess it's getting close to $200 billion in revenue. So it's grown quite uh, considerably. But it's been it's been a very interesting journey, and I guess uh, the key takeaway for for you guys would be that you know um, if you ever get an opportunity to do something that you know absolutely nothing about, but it, it sounds interesting, uh, then please do it. Because uh, if I hadn't raised my hand back in 1995 when uh, somebody asked if I wanted to make uh, the online newspaper. Um, then, um, then I definitely wouldn't have had the chance to to join Google uh, later, and that was um, it was an incredible uh, journey, a lot of fun, uh, a lot of learning, of course, and um, and I think Google sort of changed the way that uh, most people think about, of course, advertising, but also business as a whole. Uh, leadership and um, and uh, maybe some uh, some guiding principles on how to run a business. So, uh, but before we carry on, could you guys, since it's only three of you, could you just tell me what you are studying so I know sort of what might interest you to talk about? Start with Anastasia, maybe. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, I study. Uh... Right now, I'm in my last year of university. I study film production, but like, it's not film production at all. We study different kind of things like leadership, organizational uh, structure, I management, marketing, theater, everything. So, okay. Yeah. And you are in Bergen? Unfortunately, I'm not. Hopefully, no. I'll be in Norway as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, but I'm getting my degree abroad. Oh, okay, okay. In my home country, yeah. Yeah, cool. And Hamad? Uh, yes, uh, I graduated uh, last year uh, from uh, the Arctic University of Norway in Narvik. Oh, cool. Uh, and uh, I studied aerospace control engineering. Uh, yeah. It's related to space. Uh, so right now I'm looking for a full-time job. And uh, yes, this is about me. Cool. Are you? Uh, you wouldn't happen to be a, like a front end or back end developer, are you? No. 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 <laughs> I'm looking for some of those. <laughs> it's uh, the, the it's related to software engineering. What I have studied is about uh, space, uh, but like I am interested in project management, so I'm also doing a Google's professional certification in project management. I okay. don't know if you know they are offering few online certifications. Sure. Sure. So I'm doing that uh, besides like just to increase my skill set, you know. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, and uh, so um, 
I got a long list of questions uh, from uh, from Pascal, uh, who sent out this invitation, and I assume that the two of you were not the ones who provided all of those questions. So it would sort of be silly of me to actually start going through these questions, because there would be questions of somebody else who didn't bother showing up, right? Or did I forget one? Are there more people here? Yeah, Stephanie and Jasmine, maybe you can say hi as well. Um, okay, hello. Um, my name is Stephanie. I am currently studying natural resource management, specializing in biology. Yeah. I'm at the. I'm in Trondheim uh, mm -hmm. at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Yeah. Excellent. And Jasmine. Uh, I'm studying masters in science with major in finance in Oslo at BI here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. Good. And then we got uh, one uh, one final uh, participant there, um, which name I cannot see. Could the... Uh... We have Tao. Um, oh, okay. That person left again. <laughs> okay. Maybe Monica would like to say hi as well and say uh, what you're studying, Monica. Hi, yeah, I'm studying my master's in innovation and entrepreneurship. Okay, cool. So, so what I said to the others uh, was that I, I got a lot of questions, uh, or I, I received a list of questions from uh, probably many more people than you. Uh, so, and since we're so few people, I figured we could just have an open uh, dialogue about, um, uh, you know, the things you might be wondering about when it comes to anything around Google, anything about, uh, you know, uh, leadership, communication, uh, whatever. Um, but it would sort of be uh, strange to go through the list of questions if most of them are probably not written by you guys. Uh, so uh, um, if would anyone like to be to go first with the with a question or uh, otherwise I just pick one from the list. So it's sort of up to you guys. Uh, I, I have a question. Actually, yes. I also sent a few questions, uh, I think, for this session, but I can just uh, say. Uh, since I'm looking for a job, I am also active on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I uh, like I try to network over there. I message people and sometimes I got response, sometimes not. Uh, so like Mm, I want to know, like, if you know about LinkedIn, how it can be useful, you know, for networking in Norway. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about in Norway, uh, in uh, Europe as well? Yeah. So, and how to approach, how to keep the communication going, you know, uh, and how you can make the connection useful for yourself. Yeah. Uh, because, okay, you, 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 uh, connect with someone, they reply you, but how, like, what would be the next step, you know, to ask politely or to show that you are a sincere person or, you know, you want, uh, if they can help you somehow uh, yeah. and you continue the conversation somehow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good, good question. I, I think LinkedIn is extremely useful and I know that, um, it's it's really Google's primary uh, recruiting, um, you know, platform. Uh, Google has about uh, 500 recruiters that uh, basically scan LinkedIn every single day looking for candidates and uh, basically call people out of the blue. So, so you know, and, and I'm sure most large companies uh, do that. Um, so uh, I would say it's, uh, it's uh, almost reckless not having a very good uh, LinkedIn profile. Um, so I would I would definitely spend some time and maybe even a little bit of money in terms of having a, you know like a, like a pro or like a premium account uh, and and making sure you uh, uh, you know appear when uh, when people search for you. Uh, when it comes to that, I must say um, I also get um, you know, uh, messages on LinkedIn every single day from people who uh, are looking for work. And what seems to me is that uh, people are basically, um, you know, uh, attacking this problem as if they were hunting, uh, 
you know, um, hunting with a shotgun. You know, it's uh, so they're aiming too wide, basically. And uh, so it seems seems like the people who contact me haven't really done their homework in terms of what kind of people I might be looking for. Um, and uh, and so uh, so unfortunately, you know, uh, I end up maybe not even responding to most people because uh, it is so different what they could do is so different from what i need that uh, that i simply don't have the time which is a, a little bit unfortunate um now that said um I, I i would continue to use linkedin i would continue to contact people but i would really you know do my homework on uh, on exactly uh, you know uh, what uh, their uh, the, their organization is doing, I would look at their job ads and uh, their openings and see what kind of jobs they have, and then basically be more specific. Be like you know, okay, I see you have this job uh, vacant. It matches my you know my skills and my education and background uh, pretty good. You know, here's my resume. I would love to meet with you, and so on. Um, and uh, and I mean the whole the whole goal here should be to get the meeting, right? And, uh, and uh, you know uh, I think Norway is, in my experience, it's getting better, but Norway is still, uh, you know, uh, a country that has a lot to learn when it comes to uh, you know diversity and inclusion and and these things i'm i'm you know i'm sorry to say as as a, as a norwegian and this is something i'm extremely focused on i'm i'm uh, on the board of uh, sema which is the the center for diversity uh, leadership uh, see it's called sema.no and um, where the whole focus is to uh, you know change the mindset of Norwegian leaders to understand the value of diversity in an organization, not just from like ticking the box on, oh yeah, I have 50% women or I have, you know, 20% of my, of my employees um, uh, come from minorities or other countries and these things, you know, that's basically doing people a disservice, but making people understand that, um, you know, diversity competence, as we call it, is incredibly valuable you know just i'm you know somebody might speak four languages somebody might speak uh, and understand speak the language and understand the culture of 30 percent of the clients of this company much better than any of the employees you know isn't that something valuable and so on so um uh, so but but the reason i mentioned this is that um uh, that it is unfortunately still a little bit tricky to uh, you know to break um, the glass ceiling and the, and the glass walls uh, in in the Norwegian business community so uh, the, there are several ways several things you can do about that first of all attending things like this is a good idea you, you know get people to know you and as I tell, as I tell anyone regardless of what they want to do and uh, what kind of business they're in or whatever everybody needs an ambassador right so so a good friend of mine is the ceo of shipstead uh christian skogenlund she was used to be the head of the confederacy of norwegian enterprises uh, nho and uh, she always points out as the main thing for her incredible success is that she had two or three like so-called ambassadors that she would really really trust people that would speak on her behalf um you know in any situation uh and uh, basically uh, make sure that you know others would get uh, a, a good impression of her which is uh, is very important and um so that's one one way in um by you know finding those uh, those people out there it could be a professor it could be somebody in the business uh, world uh, it could even be a fellow student who has some network but somebody who can speak highly of you and open doors and introduce you to people and be a reference that is very important um the second thing is uh, there are also um uh, organizations that you know, like networking organizations like isaac 
but also like, uh, for instance, American Chamber of Commerce, uh, there are other uh, national uh, groups, uh, or you have like the African American, no, African Norwegian Business uh, Association, you have uh, the similar for the UK and for Canada and for other countries. And, and I think these, um, it's good to, to make these connections as well. And then you have um, even more specific, um, uh, SEMA has a, like a female leadership program, uh, which uh, I think they call Sea Talent. And also the, it's an organization called uh, MUC, which stands for Diversity, Ambition and Competence that um, that also uh, focuses on on helping um, people who are you know who don't have a huge network in norway to to get out there uh, but it but in my mind honestly it all starts by being present on linkedin and um, and uh, yeah so um i you know sometimes i mean the the, the biggest problem is getting the first job right when you got the first job, it basically doesn't matter what you studied. It doesn't matter if you have a network. If you get your first job, you, you're all set. So um, I'm sorry that was a long uh, answer, to, but it's a good question and it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I have uh, several, two questions, I would say. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, there is this one thing that I've noticed when when applying to jobs in Norway, and that is, for example, for a person uh, just like me that comes from outside an EU country, no matter how much I am, uh, I am eligible for the not eligible, but like qualified equivalent to the position. Yeah, qualified mm -hmm. for the position. I would not get it because I'm not in Norway and I'm not from an EU country. So I wonder how can I make the employers know that I actually am willing to to be uh, to work and to do everything they want me to do, uh, and how do I make them know that even though I come from outside the EU, I still am uh, qualified. I still am a person that will work hard because I've gotten like five or six uh, job interviews. I even learned Norwegian up to B2, wow. and uh, I did this all in, in one year, and I've gotten these jobs and all, and they were like, oh, you're qualified, but the problem is you come from outside the EU. We can't mm. do that much. And I just wonder, is there any way I can actually change this constant loop? Because it's really uh, influencing my confidence when it comes to applying the jobs. Yeah, well, uh, well, it shouldn't really influence your confidence because it has nothing to do with you, you know. And, and I, I think that's in, very important to realize that it's not about you, it's about the system. Um, and uh, the, the way, um, uh, if I can use Google as an example, uh, because it's a little bit easier, uh, we, um, we actually hired many people from outside the EU. And, uh, and the reason was that we were, you know, desperate to find uh, good engineers and, um, and very often, you know, the, the good engineers came from, for instance, Russia, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, you know, China or India, right? And, um, and so at Google, there would be, um, uh, you know, resources to actually help someone with the right skills to come either to the US or to your European Union country. Um, I think if I were you, I would be a little bit careful with the companies that you approach, because if you go to a company with like 50 employees, they probably don't have the resources that it would take to get you, um, you know, the, the work permit needed to move to, the, to, move to Norway. But if you go to a company uh, that is, you know, large, like, um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, it could be Ignor, it could be Orchid, or, um, you know, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, what used to be called Veritas, DNV, GL, uh, or, uh, you know, that kind of company, then it would be so much easier. And, I, you know, I know plenty of people 
who who came um, you know from India, for instance, to work for for these companies. So uh, so it is it is definitely uh, it is possible, but it's very difficult if you. For instance, if if I had a job for you at my startup, I just started a company. We're only three people. Uh, I I think that I would avoid having to you know take on that paper mill of work that it is to 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 get an American to move to Norway or you know or somebody from India or Russia. It would it would simply be overwhelming for a small company to do that. It would. Probably costs fifty to hundred thousand in legal fees and uh, and lots of lots of hours of work that I could spend on doing something else. I think that's that's the harsh reality. So so go for the big companies. That's uh, that's my best um, uh, best excuse. I don't know where you're from, but um, uh, but uh, are, which country? Are... The time. I think the country that I come from also makes it a little bit. Uh... You know, unstable because I come from North Macedonia and we have like a lot of political instability. So yep. I don't think that people would want to have to do anything with person from my country, especially. I don't know about that, uh, but um, uh, no, I, I really don't know. So um, uh, I don't see how that's that should be more difficult than. Um, you know, Russia or the Ukraine or uh, whatever. So, um, but uh, uh, yeah, but you you have you have your mind set on Norway, I guess, since you learned the language. Yeah, yeah, and also my boyfriend lives there, so we figured out it's the best to just meet okay. people there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I, you know, um, in in. Um, I brought uh, an American back from the U.S. and uh, and we didn't want to get married just because we were going to move to Norway. But at least she was able to get a work permit um, and move to Norway because um, we had been living together in the U.S. and that um, uh, you know that changed everything. So um, I don't Something know if like that's yeah if that's an option for you. I don't know if uh, if that would work. It's not. <laughs> oh, it's not. So, okay. Because we haven't left. So, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, no, you picked the most difficult country. I am. I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> in terms. Of, <laughs> in terms of. In terms of how the government uh, handles uh, applications, it's definitely a difficult country to to move to. So. Definitely, um, if you're from outside the EU. Uh, it's... Yeah. But uh, but I think at least uh, unless you already have an application in the system, I think if you got uh, a job offer with uh, a large corporation in Norway, that would change everything. Mm -hmm. But don't spend your time on the small companies. Yeah, that's my advice. Um, anyone? Yeah. Anyone <laughs> else? Yes, I've I'm excited about this conversation. <laughs> Um, I completely understand Anastasia's fears because I know what it's like to be in that kind of situation. Uh -huh. But I do agree with what you say to avoid the small companies because I've kind of experienced it. So I've always limited my applications to either international bodies or much, much larger companies. Mm -hmm. But that comes with a new challenge. Um, in my experience, Whenever I try to apply to the bigger organizations, are you able to hear me? I hear you. Okay. And I'm saying, in my experience, when I apply to the larger companies, it's a lot harder to be filtered into the system. So a lot of times it's harder to get past the application stage. And when I ask um, my peers or uh, people who have more experience, they tell me that when you're moving from uh, from the from a developing country to a developed country like Norway, you must have stellar um, work. You must have either stellar academic records or some exceptional range of skills that you must have. Um, I guess three times <laughs> the expertise that an ordinary applicant has. So, is this actually real? 
because you can it, it it can get very scary and overbearing for someone who's really really trying to exploit their potential and you know like to grow so i find myself very terrified but mm-hmm. i keep trying really really hard you know something like that so yeah. is, it, is it very real or it's just rumors yeah oh um you know i i think it goes back to what i said uh, before about getting a couple of like ambassadors um i think honestly i think um uh you know what what people what employers what most employers look for are uh you know interesting resourceful intelligent nice people right and i i can't tell you how tired i am of for instance you know a, a norwegian boy who uh, lived his whole life with his parents uh, until he graduated from uh, you know bi or whatever with like straight a's and then you ask him have you ever worked and he's like uh no and he's like why no, i didn't have to okay so the, the point is you know if if you live a completely worry free life um and uh, and uh, you know get fed by your mom and you go to school then any any idiot should be able to get an a uh so at least at google we were, would much rather have somebody who you know had the guts to move from another country go to one of the best schools in that country um and and handle all of those challenges that come along with that and uh, and then um, you know maybe not be the best in the class but you know hey what can you expect you know it's like um you have um, so much other stuff to bring along right so so the the thing is um the the problem in the problem there is if you are completely alone and you have no network you are really you know uh disadvantaged in a way so so in, if i were you in your case i you know i would you know uh, try to i mean the, the way kristin did this kristin skogen you you can if you don't know her please google her um she literally asked you know she would call uh somebody and say can you be my mentor and then you know uh, after a while uh these mentors sort of became um became uh, her her ambassadors basically and they were sitting on boards and you know in leading positions in Norway and uh, and eventually Kristen started getting interesting offers so uh, so i mean that's that's one way of doing it i'll tell you what how i got my job um uh in uh, my my first job when um, the job i didn't tell you about when i started was before i came to norway to start working for um for uh for often posten was i worked for a big financial institution in the us called uh, john hancock it's a huge uh, life insurance and uh, like annuities company and i was lucky enough to uh, to get a job there uh, just after college and basically the reason they hired me was the fact that i was norwegian uh so so uh you know they um they wanted somebody who you know was already outside of their comfort zone so i think um for me that worked out well and and i definitely wouldn't have gotten the job in in norway if i hadn't had that job in the us and um so i think you know you uh, and and maybe more of you should also look at at that uh, you know uh, look at your background and experience as an extra asset that a lot of norwegian students don't have so um uh, so it's you know it, it brings like i said it it's it's a uh, diversity competence that no one else has you have the uh, languages that uh, you know nobody else has and plus you move to this you know cold uh, god forsaken country to go to school i mean that's amazing right so uh, and that's an asset in itself so all you need now is some kind of network 
and um, and you know this is one way of getting that. So um, uh, and the first thing you should of course do is hook up with me on LinkedIn. So um, uh, not that that's going to get you a job, but it it might. You never know. So. Um, uh, and, you know, don't be afraid to hook up with, uh, you know, if you meet someone interesting, if you read about someone interesting, uh, reach out to them on LinkedIn, ask to hook up, say, you know, I read about you in the paper this morning, I thought it was so interesting, or I heard your speech just uh, you know, last week at the university, it was amazing, do you mind if we hook up? Just keep building your network like that. And uh, if you tell people why, they will almost always say yes, you know, if they're like, you know, people get get uh, flattered by uh, by some some praise. So uh, so don't be don't be shy. Just uh, just reach out. All right. Yeah, I, I, it's you know, it, it's uh, tricky to be more uh, specific, but uh, but that's um, um, yeah. It's a great answer. It actually covers, you've actually covered many bases that I was going to ask about. And I think that gives me some confidence, especially knowing that you are giving it as a personal experience, that you went somewhere else really far from home and it worked in your favor. So I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. And, you know, I am... I, um... I, just to, uh, I mean, there, there are uh, in my network there are a few people w uh, that have, uh, especially women actually, that have gotten incredibly successful in Norway, uh, who have uh, you know uh, a, com a completely uh, you know different background than than most. Um, so. Uh, uh, so I, you know, if you hook up with me on LinkedIn, I can connect you to these people as well, and then they might uh, see that, hmm, you know, oh wow, Stephanie is like me 20 years ago. You know, I um, I want to help her. You know, um, and so on. So, uh, so I think, um, you know, that's that's the kind of uh, uh, people you want to connect with. People who understand what you're going through and uh, and uh, and the challenge that challenges that you are all facing in Norway and uh, and uh, that that might be willing to uh, to help right so um, and um, and I think it's a good time as well uh, Norway is slowly starting to wake up to the idea that uh, that it's a very good idea to hire people that uh, represent uh, you know um, like uh, every part of the population and not just people that you know you grew up with which has sort of been uh, you know like 50 years ago um, you know the only people who got the real jobs were like friends of the people who already had those jobs and fortunately it doesn't work like that anymore so uh, so um, so that's that's good um, any um, any other questions uh, yes I have, uh, uh, like, because of Corona, you cannot, uh, like, ask someone to meet in person, maybe. So, in this time, what, how do you suggest, like, uh, to approach and ask people to meet, like, is it okay to ask them online, to meet online, and maybe, uh, do you think people will agree for that? And they will yeah, take yeah. out time? I, I, honestly, I think it is so much easier to meet people online um you know the the threshold to say yes is so much lower than it used to be um so that's no problem also um what some people ask me to is uh to go for a walk you know that's fine that's not you know you can do that in corona uh, so uh so i have uh, you know often walking meetings with uh, with people and um, but but absolutely to ask people for a short uh, video conference is no problem and it's so much easier for people they don't have to travel they don't have to dress they don't have to do anything you know it's it's super easy so um so so that shouldn't be a problem at all uh, uh, yeah uh, another question is uh, 
if someone wants to find a job uh, in the field which he has not studied uh, like if he if someone want to switch their field is it like how can they network into another field you know uh, yeah I, i have studied aerospace control engineering i have applied to many jobs here in norway but because of the security clearance reasons because it's also involved with the defense so it's hard for me to find a job in aerospace industry so like right now i'm also like uh, like i'm interested in project management so i'm doing this course project management course but i'm also learning some other like ui path rpa uh, stuff so i want to switch into that direction or into that field and i wonder how can i network more into into those areas hmm oh uh, I, i i don't you know of course it's a little bit sad when you when you are an aerospace engineer and uh, uh, but but i see the challenges there the thing is um you know i think most companies and especially we we saw this at google all the time we hired people with all kinds of backgrounds and i think more and more companies are doing that um keep in mind uh, that there are two things first of all when you go to the university you learn how to learn right and even though you might think that you know when you graduate you will be the world's foremost expert in aerospace engineering that's unfortunately not the case um the fact is that the the gap between what you are learning at school and what the employers uh, expect of you has never been higher than it is today uh so the you know the difference has never never been bigger and that probably has to do with academia struggling to keep up with the technological you know uh, evolution which is now faster than ever right and so especially in tech and marketing um this this is an issue but i think that what you have proven uh with your studies and basically no matter what you have studied is that you know you had a plan and you were able to fulfill that plan and go ahead and complete it which is in itself a, a big asset and uh, but for for a company like google for instance they really don't care if you're a civil engineer aerospace engineer or you know a machine engineer um because what they're going to teach you is something you couldn't learn in school anyway and so basically google has the idea of hire for attitude and train for skills and um and so they hire people with any kind of background we that we hired um people with no degree we hired lots of people with uh, you know social sciences business degrees uh, you know uh, macroeconomic degrees and all kinds of engineers um and uh, you know i assume you're you know if you're an aerospace engineer you're probably as good or maybe even better in math and physics than any other engineer so so uh, you know uh, that that shouldn't matter um so uh, i think though what you need to you know when you apply is to to you know try to you know make people understand why you are applying I mean the fact that you want a job is not a good enough reason. It's like I I you know I'm interested in this job because and uh, because I can do this and this and this and this and this and I want to learn this and this. And also keep in mind that you know uh, there's it's unlikely that y- you know you are the one who's going to make that business a success. So I think for for at least in Google what we would look for are the people who are curious smart and willing to learn those are the you know most important things and also people that have a, a great deal of uh, humility you know they're able to understand that they're not necessarily the center of the universe and they still have a lot to learn and also people that are uh, very open to cooperation with others uh, and don't have like what we call sharp elbows you know who just who just want to succeed but maybe people who 
want others to succeed by helping them, right? And um, and so I think uh, that's important. If um, if you want to know more about that, you can read a book called uh, How Google Works. It's written by Eric Schmidt, and it's on Amazon for like ten dollars. Ten dollars. It's a really good book, and it tells you everything about how Google recruits. And it's not only Google; it's like all the companies in Silicon Valley that are all over the world. They basically think the same way, and and they're looking for the same kind of people. So, um, yeah. Uh, one more question: uh, What do you think of uh, this strategy that you approach small companies or startups and ask them about, uh, like? about internships or to work for them you know uh, to gain experience uh, do you think this would also be a good idea to network and to you know uh, get into the industry into the or to find a job you know afterwards yeah um now are you are you finished with your education yes i graduated last year yeah so you know it's it's a little bit passive to ask for internships when you are done. Um, I was just helping another guy uh, who who also graduated last year and who struggled to find a job. And he was he kept asking people for internships. And I'm like, why why on earth do you want an internship? You're you're an adult. You're finished. You know, are you going to go back to take your PhD? He's like, no, no, no. I, I just want a job. And I'm like, you know, well, get a job then, right? So um, so I think. Um, Honestly, I think that's selling yourself short. When it comes to when it comes to startups, what you could do is basically say, "I'm willing to work for you for free for two months." And if you don't if you don't like what you get after two months, then uh, then I'll leave. Uh, I mean, that's that's a possibility. Um, but really, uh, you know, when you're done with a master's and ready to move on and like you know get a stable income and everything um, you, you shouldn't sell yourself short and and uh, jump on internships um, uh, by the way i really really like this idea uh, which you just said in the last uh, like to ask them like if that is how you can also know how do they work or if you can fit over there or not uh, because i have seen like uh, while i was like applying uh, there are one or two companies or startups you can say which are really interested to me so uh, i was thinking to contact them and this is what i was thinking how should i approach them you know yeah uh, so i really liked your last idea i think uh, i might use that use that actually yeah i, I think especially with startups that's uh, that's probably a good idea you could even work for shares you know sweat equity and um and so um but uh, but again as you know as i said uh, uh, to all of you uh, feel free to hook up with me on uh, on linkedin uh, we could keep the discussion going um, uh, there and um, even though i don't necessarily have a network within all of your branches i might have you know something here and something there who knows so uh um so uh you know it's um sometimes it's it's all about connecting with the right uh, with the right people so um yeah do we have any other questions from the yes. small panel yes, yes. <laughs> okay this is back to some of the things hamad was talking about i've forgotten one but the second one is uh the last uh comment you've made that when you finish um your master's you don't necessarily need to go for internships. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense to go straight into the job market. But um, these days, it's like um, you can, if you, from the job descriptions I see these days, the requirements even just for entry level jobs is will require the master's degree, yes, but like five years experience. So you might finish your master's degree, but you still have to go back looking for experience. So I can imagine in Hamad's situation that if he doesn't have like three to five years experience, it's probably going to be hard because I, even I see it myself, getting into a, like a, just an entry level job is really hard. Unless yeah. it's an industry specific thing, but that's what I've seen. It's really, really hard. 
so hard. So I don't know what can someone do to just. Well, I, honestly, I, you know, if if a job specifically asks for five years experience, then you probably shouldn't apply for that job if you don't have five years experience or or two years. In many cases, um, they will. Um, you know, people that ask for five years experience don't really know what they're asking for. They're just saying something. So that you should keep that in mind as well. So sometimes, um, I just had this discussion with a colleague today. I said, what are you looking for? Somebody with like 10 years experience? And he said, well, you know, if they're good enough, I'm willing to hire a graduate student. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So basically right there, you have the problem, right? Uh, it's like, uh, it's, we're looking for a tech lead, somebody who, who can be a, a so-called back-end developer, but also manage a team uh, of uh, engineers in the Ukraine. And uh, so my my instinct then was like somebody with lots of experience. And he's like, I don't really care. If, if that person is good enough, we can hire a graduate. Now, if we made an ad and put that ad on fin.no or LinkedIn, that ad would probably say five years experience. So, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, and uh, so in some cases you have to read between the lines and see what are they really looking for here. Now, in some cases there is like non-negotiable, you know, that you've got to have those five years or you, you're not interesting. That's fine. That, then there is a specific reason for that. But in many cases, um, it's basically just something they say. So, um, now I don't know if you are, if any of you guys are mobile interested in moving other places, but for instance, at Google's European headquarter in Dublin, they hire like, I would say they hire a thousand people a year, maybe 2000 people a year to work there. And they come from the, and they're basically all graduates. Right, so uh, people that just came out with a bachelor's degree or just finished master's degree, and uh, and uh, there you can go into any direction of you know whatever Google has to offer, and then after three four years you get up get the opportunity to maybe apply for a role in a country of your choosing, and that could be you know Norway or it could be the US or it could be um, because once you're in. You know, Google will bend over backwards to keep you and make sure you get a work permit in the US or, you know, whatever. And, um, and like, for instance, we have, they have offices in, in, of course, in Kenya, they have in South Africa, they have in Nigeria, they have in uh, North Africa, they have in Middle East, uh, all over Asia, and so on. So, so that's also, I mean, all, all of the big companies have these entry level factories, basically, where they, basically spend, they invest like one or two years to just teach you everything they know. I mean, that might also be a good way to start. And, um, and, uh, and then, like I said, they hire people with all kinds of um, uh, backgrounds. So, um, um, yeah, but I, um, uh, you know, um, so it's, again, try to read between the lines. Sometimes that five years is just uh, is not real, and um, and yeah. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I see Anastasia has another question. Yes, uh, I'm going to be as short as possible. Um, right now, I'm working on two projects, and uh, as a leader, I had uh, several problems, and that is how can I motivate, for example, the people who work on the projects uh, to be more productive? Because uh, I found out that some of them uh, struggle because of the pandemic. So you as a leader, uh, do you have any advice for me? Are you talking about the project in school now or? No, um, I have, uh, I'm working on two projects which are USAID funded and uh, Swiss, Swiss Embassy funded. So okay. those are like NGO projects. Okay, but there are actually, these are employees somewhere who's actually getting paid, right? Mm, no, not, not them, so not all of them. So yeah, <laughs> Okay. It makes sense. Some of them uh, are, some of them are not. It's based like an engagement project. 
Okay, okay. So it's is are, are there are they all students on the side or uh, how is that? Yeah, they are students. Mostly. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you know uh, a project like that might be the thing that would set them apart uh, from basically all the other students who didn't have a project like that, right? And, and especially uh, at Google, for instance, um, and I, sorry, there are a lot of Google examples here, but you know, that's where I spent the last 15 years. So, um, but, you know, volunteer work, for instance, for uh, organizations um, is hugely important. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, the, the last thing we want is this uh, spoiled uh, brat who just stayed home with his parents and got straight A's, right? We would much rather have somebody who, you know, volunteered uh, working for an organization and uh, maybe to make ends meet, you know, had a part-time job and, you know, um, uh, coached a soccer team and uh, maybe was a single mom and, and still got through college. You know, it's like, that's the kind of people we're looking for. So... So I think um, yeah, right now, you know, it's like when I went to school, only 10% bothered taking a master's degree. Uh, you didn't need to, uh, or you didn't, you know, it's like it, it was too specialized, sort of. And now everyone is taking a master's degree. So it's like almost silly. It's like the whole world of millennials and Generation Zs are like super overqualified. So how on earth do you make yourself stand out? And the only way to do that is uh, through your part-time activities. And uh, so, um, so I think, um, you know, that in itself should be motivation enough to work. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's, of course, uh, easier said than done, I guess. But, uh, but that's what I would focus on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Pascal, do we have time for one more? Or? Yes, so I guess we can entertain a couple of more questions for the next yeah. few minutes. Yeah, if there are more. Anyone else? Yes, I have another question. Yes. So I wanted to ask, um, when I saw the poster for today's meeting, it also shows that you're in consulting. And yes. I wanted to ask, what is the consulting industry like? Because I feel like it's a very um, closed industry. Getting in is a bit technical, and I feel like the skills in that industry are very much sought after. So what is it like, and how do you get in? Okay, uh, good question. I um, um what I, what I decided to do was um, I, I realized that there was a lot of interest in my background from Google. And so I wanted to help uh, smaller companies implement some of the things that were successful at Google. So I basically just made myself available and got uh, four uh, big um, uh, you know, projects with, with four different companies that I basically spend one day a week on. Uh, and then I spent one day a week with, uh, <coughs> with Startup Lab and Antler to, um, to uh, like accelerators. Um, so I can't really speak on behalf of like McKinsey and Accenture and Boston Consulting Group and all of those, because those are companies that I really wouldn't want to work for anyway, if I, in my case. But, um, but I think you're right. Um, uh, you know, um, I know that those companies, uh, they are constantly looking for people. They are very much focused on, uh, you know, hiring people with international backgrounds. And, uh, and they're, you know, uh, also, um, you know, they're, they're all, you know, English is their first language. So, you know, everything happens in English. Um, and, and sometimes they hire, uh, you know, uh, graduates and uh, maybe as uh, trainees or uh, in, in entry level positions. Um, and uh, it just depends, you know, it goes in, uh, in waves, I have a feeling. Um, and again, they are also, you know, looking for the people with the right attitude and then training for skills because they know that nobody who comes out of university knows how to do what they do. So, you know, if you get in there, they will train you to, to become, um, uh, you know, uh, high productive consultants. 
Um, so, uh, but I think the best bet there would be um, uh, the larger, uh, most well-known uh, companies like, um, you know, Deloitte uh, or or McKinsey or um, uh, BCG or, or something like that. Uh, the smaller and the more local the consulting firm gets, the more difficult it is, uh, I think. Then, then the the demand for many many years' experience will will increase. But uh, the large ones, I think, tend to shape uh, you know shape you into what they want. So they sometimes look for for graduates and. Um, and especially if you go to NTNU, um, that is, you know, the the main uh, main school that these companies are looking for people. So um, uh, I'm sure they had some kind of um, career day at uh, NTNU this spring. They usually do, and um, that's probably one way to get in touch with them. Are you? Is this your last year, Stephanie? No, this is my first year. Oh, okay. So, uh, how how uh, how many years will you be there then? One more year, or? Yeah, just one more year. Okay, good. Well, then then um, then I would definitely take advantage of uh, of the of the career days that are probably happening happening in the fall. Yeah, I would expect them to to be up there in like uh, October, September, October, maybe on um, the Antonio Career Day. We Google was always there in the in the old days. And, um, and we made a lot of connections uh, there. So, um, yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? It's, uh, I have time, but uh, it's up to Pascal who might have to abandon this room. I don't know. We have eight minutes more. Okay. So if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to exhaust everything. Another <laughs> question. <laughs> um, okay, so um, um, now this one is geared towards leadership. How do I instill the principle of leadership in myself? <laughs> How do I do that? <clears throat> um, I... Um... You know, I, 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 I um, <laughs> how do you do that? Um, I think, you know, there are two kinds of people in my mind. It's the people who know they are leaders and the people who don't know they are leaders. But I think we all have the capacity to be leaders. Mm -hmm. Now, but also you have to keep in mind, do you want to be a leader? I think that's the most important thing to ask you. Uh, I, I was surprised at Google by how many people I met who had absolutely no interest in being a leader and who were brilliant people. So I, you know, I would approach people and say, "Okay, you've been here now for five years. Um, uh, what, what is your what is your plan for the next couple of years? You know, should we get you on, on the leadership track?" And they're like, "No, nope, I'm totally happy." And they're like, okay, but don't you want to manage people? It's like, no, that's the last thing I want. It's like, okay, interesting. Uh, and then you realize that, yeah, okay, maybe people are different. So what you have to find out first is, you know, do you really want to be a leader? Um, and if you really do that, and for the right reasons, and of course you have to know, uh, know the reasons, but, you know, in my case, it was simple. Because, uh, you know, when I started playing in the sandbox when I was three years old with my friends, um, I, it was, uh, I just basically took the lead and I said, okay, guys, let's play this. And then we played that, right? Or 10 years later, when we were going out on Saturdays and Sundays to play football, I was always the one who called everyone and said, let's meet at one o'clock, the same place as always, and let's play football. And then we all met and played football. So I always knew that I wanted to, uh, to you know, manage people and, and, and lead uh, teams. Uh, but, uh, but not everybody knows that. So, but I've seen, I mean, uh, I think the best example is, um, uh, is um, you know, the guy is head of Google now, Sundar Pichai. He, um, 
you know, he grew up in India. He had um, a middle-class home in uh, in Madras, as it was called, Chennai now. And, um, uh, you know, his family didn't have a computer. They got a phone when he was like 10. Um, they, I don't think they had a TV until he, until he was like 19 or something. Uh, so, you know, and he, he was sleeping on a mattress on the floor, you know, and you can read his book and read all about it. But the, the thing is... Um, he didn't know he wanted to be a leader. And then he got the opportunity to study in the US because he was so good at school. So he got a scholarship and then he got a job at Google and he was very young when he was hired. And, uh, and uh, he was actually below me on the, on the internal, um, you know, uh, level. And then he just kept doing the right thing. You know, he, he just kept uh, delivering again and again, and again, and he would get to be in charge of different projects. And uh, so he just had an amazing career at Google. And uh, when you meet him, he is the nicest, most humble, almost introvert person you can imagine. So, um, you know, um, and, and this is a guy who's like literally making $200 million a year. Right, um, and but he he's not the kind of guy who flies private jets and lives in a big fancy house and and all that. You know, he's the same guy he always was. He's just out there to do a good job. And so I remember once I, I walked into a, um, I, I was showing some customers around um, uh, one of our coolest buildings in in California, and uh, we were like twenty cost twenty people in the group. And I opened uh, the door to one of our coolest uh, meeting rooms, uh, which was a, like a nice auditorium. And Sundar was sitting there by himself, uh, reading something. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Sundar, I didn't know you were here. And, he, and, he, um, and uh, I closed the door and then he came running out. He said, hey, Jan, I'm sorry, I hadn't booked this room. If you need this room, uh, just take it. And I'm like, no, 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 of course, you know, just, uh, yeah, I just wanted to show my clients. And he's like, clients first and then he went out and he let me go in with my clients and i just thought that was so amazing and i'll give you another example when my first job was um uh, i was cleaning at a hotel when i was 16 i got a job uh, cleaning a hotel in oslo and um i wasn't very good at it but it was a job and um you know I, I was one of those spoiled bats i guess you might say but at least i had a job and um i kept that job while i uh, through all of my studies so i was working at the hotel until i was done in college and um one day i was cleaning the lobby and uh, i missed the spot and then uh, the manager of the whole hotel walked by in his pinstriped suit later and i was standing there talking to somebody in the reception uh, sort of just wasting my time and uh, the guy looked at that spot on the floor. He knew I was standing there, but he didn't, didn't, didn't look at me. He knew I was watching. And then he walked over to a closet. Then he grabbed uh, a broom and a bucket and he cleaned the floor. And then he just walked back to the closet and put it, put it back afterwards. And he didn't look at me. But I can tell you that was the biggest leadership lesson I had ever been given and probably have ever been given ever been given since right so so the point was that was his way of telling me we i want this hotel to look better and it's your job to help me look you know help me make it look good and so every single day after that i made sure the floor was you know 110 percent perfect so that this wouldn't happen again right and um so, so the thing is, um, uh, and in, in my mind, he was not some guy who was like, you know, uh, that was a typical, you know, leader in a way. Um, he was just a guy who worked his way to the top of a hotel, but, but he solved that in such an elegant, elegant manner. And instead of yelling at me in front of my colleagues, which he could have done, which many people would have done, he just showed me how to do it. And, uh, by doing that, he knew that he would never have to mention this again. And, um, and uh, yeah. So, uh, to this day, my wife is extremely pleased when I clean the floor because it's always very, very clean. 
because of that one lesson. <laughs> so I think um, I think that's um, my best tip for you. But first of all, the worst thing you can do for yourself is if you want to be a leader, to please someone else. Uh, if you want to please your manager, or if you want to please your parents or someone else, uh, that doesn't work. You have to want to be a leader because you want to be a leader and you want to make a difference. And that's the most important thing. And I think if that's really something you want, then um, then you just have to jump when whenever you get the chance. Whenever somebody asks you, are you ready to take on this little team of two people? Then you say yes. And if they don't ask you, then you ask for then you ask for the opportunity. You know, and uh, and and don't stop. And then if you if they don't want to give it a chance, then you switch jobs to another company that wants to give it that chance. And I would say, don't wait too long. Don't wait till you're, you know, 38 before you start leading people. You start as soon as you can. And um, and I I think the best thing you can do at university, join a student organization and just start leading. You don't have to be the leader on paper, but you can lead projects. You can, um, you know, take initiatives. You can find new things to do than... And people will say, well, who the hell is going to lead that? And you can say, I can lead that. And then, yeah, then you can lead. So in, in all of uh, primary school, middle school, high school and university, I was the head of the student government for 13 years or even for 20 years, even in the military, just because I, I knew that would give me experience that would, um, would give me the chance to get my first uh, leadership role. So when I was 26, I had um, 100 people working for me. And that was quite weird because the oldest guy was 73. So um, it felt a little, little uncomfortable, but it was fun. So, um, yeah. Um, I think we're over time now. But guys, uh, feel free to hook up with me on uh, LinkedIn. And if you haven't already done so, and um, I'll be happy to, to answer more questions or, you know, connect with people in my network and so on. And um, it was nice talking to you. And I wish you all luck. Thank you. Thank you.